the G3 conference here in Atlanta. Getting ready to see some new speakers. So let's go ahead and uh, head on the inside. Alright, here we go. So I guess we're going to go ahead and head to the exhibit hall, which is right up here. I'd first like to thank the G3 Conference and Sovereign Productions for their help in organizing this debate, and I'd like to thank James White for being here to represent his side of this important issue. The topic we're debating tonight is, can Christians lose their salvation? I will present evidence that shows the answer to this question is yes. Even if someone has come to Christ and been forgiven, he can still lose his salvation through apostasy or other serious sins. Cooperate with grace. I showed in Matthew 23, 37, Jesus wanted to gather Jerusalem together, but they would not, their children. Did Jesus fail? No, they failed. God gives grace, but we're also free. My opponent has talked a lot about, well, it's, it's just God-centered and biblical. His view is, I guess I would say, very God-centered, but it's not biblical. The Bible talks about how we can receive God. It talks about how we continue to come to God, how we believe, the obedience of faith, and it warns that those who commit apostasy, those who trample the Son of God underfoot, that if they do so, that they will profane the blood of the covenant by which they were sanctified. My opponent had to go to the incredible length tonight that when a passage in Hebrews 10, 28 through 29 clearly says there will be a, a worse punishment than physical death for a believer who profanes the blood of the covenant. He has to say, well, Christ's blood sanctifies himself. There we go. Okay, there we go. All right. On my program last week, I predicted how the debate would go. And Trent listened and obeyed. Because that's exactly what I said would take place. I said I will have to spend 
then my rebuttal period explained the difference between prescriptive and descriptive text in scripture. Now I'm really looking forward to hearing uh, Trent's response to the many passages that I presented where Jesus says, none, I save all, none shall be lost, etc., etc., because I'm hoping that we all believe that we need to take all of this revelation given by the Holy Spirit of God and believe it consistently. We can't just take one and set it against something else. In an unbloody fashion. In an unbloody fashion. Now you need to understand that in Roman Catholic theology today, the belief is that the death of Christ merited a huge treasury of merit. That Jesus Christ only had to shed a single drop of blood to redeem the entire world. But since he bled copiously, there is all this excess merit that is available through the sacraments of the church. The second person in line is a legal responsibility to be able to operate the guy's phone in front of him. I thought we'd have a hundred guys here. Whenever we had a pastor's breakfast in my area in Southern California, the dudes would show up and they would eat and it would be full. This morning, four other pastors and their wives, besides me. So we're talking a room of maybe 12, 14 people. It was set up to hold a couple hundred. And the topic was pro-life. 
thankfully the speaker was not deterred. And Greg Cunningham was his name. He was a former Pennsylvania House of Representatives member. He had written a bill there that cut off funding for abortion. And then he had worked in the Reagan administration as a Justice Department official. And he gave a very persuasive defense of the pro-life view. I thought, I like this guy. It doesn't hurt the brain to listen to him. But then he did something that changed my life. He showed an eight-minute video depicting abortion. I had never seen abortion. And I watched this video that graphically depicted abortion. And I sat there and wept and thought, I am no different than the priest and the Levite who passed by on the other side of the road. They may have felt pity for the beating victim, but they didn't take pity. And Jesus said, that's not good enough when it comes to loving your neighbor. To make a very long story short, I went home that afternoon and I took that VHS tape he showed. VHS tapes were these rectangular things that, you know. And I uh, showed that to my wife and I said, I feel like my life has just been turned upside down. She said, hey, whatever's happening, I'm with you. Long story short, six months later, I resigned my associate pastor's role at that church to work full time. And the topic I've been given is the Reformation isn't over because abortion is still legal. And I want to draw for you today a parallel between the Reformation and our view of humanity. You know the gospel. The gospel says that none of us here in this room right now can do anything to perform our way to God. We cannot earn our salvation. All we can do is repent of our sins and let the righteousness of Christ be imputed to us. It's his finished work that gives us salvation, not what we do in terms of good deeds. Obviously, good deeds follow having been justified, but it is not our good deeds that make up for our bad deeds. That view, which I will, for the sake of this session, call functionalism, the belief that what makes us righteous before God is our good functions, our good behavior, that same view is driving the abortion debate in this way. Right now, in the United States, we are having a huge argument over two key questions that impact you, your children, and your grandchildren for decades to come. Here are the two key questions we're arguing about, which, by the way, will determine our national policy on abortion, doctor-assisted suicide, the definition of marriage. The first question is, is truth true? Is moral truth real and knowable, or is it just a preference like selecting chocolate over vanilla? The second question we're arguing about is human value. And that will be the focus of largely what we do here. What makes humans valuable in the first place? Are we valuable by function, meaning something we do? Or does our rights and value come from our intrinsic nature, simply because we're human? And those two rival views of human value are butting heads on the major issues of our day right now. In fact, one philosopher put it this way. In the centuries past, the big debate was over who is God. Right now, the big debate in the culture is what is man? What is it that gives us value in the first place? So how does this relate to what I just talked about, the gospel? Simply this. Christianity teaches that all humans have value simply because they bear the image of their maker. Basically, I'm going to go ahead and get out of here for the day and uh, see you guys on day two.
things about the effect we're looking for, those must be good things, and so we'll do them until they stop working, then we'll find other things to do. We know that, of course, is pragmatism. It's very, very common today. It's a tendency we find ourselves slipping into if we're not so, so careful. Get behind me, Satan. That's a good clue. <laughs> that Jesus was not thinking that Peter was the Pope by calling him Satan. I, I, don't, I don't think he'd be welcome in the Vatican if you call him <laughs> Pope Peter. So he, Jesus, Jesus called him a, 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 you're a scandal to me. <laughs> <laughs> do you need a cough drop? No. Do you have a cough? I do. You are a mom. I'll try it. Do you need a zip zip? Oh no, I'll do that. Thank you, Take it out. Oh my, please let me know. There's also a lot of hand sanitizer up there on that table. What? There's also a lot of hand sanitizer up there. As you're walking back and forth. Please pass me. I can't believe this. You know, in Peru, when I was going, I thought the highest mountains. I was always afraid to turn around and think that my old mother would be coming up behind me asking me if my socks were clean. <laughs> Church is that people are converted and pastors are trying to attract people into the church 
you never, you can't do what you ought to do in the church because no one would love you. Look at Rome, what Rome is adding to the gospel. 
It makes the two guys just in Galatia look like the living in this day and age and in this culture that it is important for us to spread the gospel. Because <laughs> that is what God is about. When you read your Bible, you might think that Jesus appears in the book of Matthew. He does. He's in the book of Genesis. He's in the book of Exodus. He's in the book of Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy all throughout every book of the Old Testament. And there's a reason for that. God created the world to save sinners. He wants to bring glory to himself by saving rebels through the redemptive work of his son. And that's it. If you've been answering the big teleological question, why am I here? That's it. You're here to get saved so that God can be glorified. And for those of us whom God graciously has saved, what better endeavor than to work with God to proclaim the good news of the gospel? Thank you, I appreciate it. 